Got a rowdy crowd. Um, please no filming in the back. I'm kidding. Um, we're filming this thing. It's on YouTube. You're welcome to watch and film however you like. Thank you guys for coming. Who's here for the first time? Oh, more than half. Wow. Okay. Um, how many people own a period revival house? How many people know what a period revival house is? Okay, so it's houses basically <clears throat> that are revivals of, you know, Tudors, Colonials, English, all those different things, the revival styles. Um, should be fun. This is actually, I was just talking to Dave, this is actually, I'm more excited about this style than Arts and Crafts. Arts and Crafts, we had uh, more interest and I talked about why that is, but um, the uh, period revival I think is uh, fun and interesting, partly because we are still building period revival houses today. I don't think they're near as good as the ones in the past, and we'll talk about that. Um, so yeah, uh, a couple of announcements. Wanted to thank the sponsors, Cucum, uh Classical Molding Collection, Ryan Mulkeen, shout out to you, buddy. Uh, Windsor One, uh, they're the ones, I've designed both their molding lines. Uh, they're traditional classical molding lines, they're really good. These guys get it, they care about design and style and everything else, and so wanted to thank them. Um, we do, Hull does, Alice back there in the back, she probably greeted you as you're coming in. She's my sales manager for the 100 year window, which is right over there. We started doing this 100-year window. She's doing lunch and learns. So if you're an architectural firm or an engineering firm, you want to know more about it, she will come to your office and uh, tell you more about it. <coughs> um, we are on YouTube, so if you're watching YouTube, please subscribe. Uh, trying to build up this viewership. Shout out to my buddy back there, Richard, Finnish Carpentry TV, good friend. Here locally, we're doing some work together. Very talented craftsman. If you're a builder and you're looking for a good craftsman, he's right there. And then the next one is May 19th, uh, which is uh, on Mid-Century Modern. Who's excited about Mid-Century Modern? Yes. I said it's probably gonna be the most popular one, so there you go. You got a bigger place, okay. Um, okay, so, period revival era, I'm not sure why it's not fitting. Main because it's really a study of and a, and, a, and a love of and a beauty of care for medieval architecture. Uh, we'll talk about what happened there, but certainly looking back to the architecture of Europe uh, and even early America, there was a rediscovery. <clears throat> it's interesting to me, we go from the arts and crafts right into this style. They don't really, you know, philosophically have much to do with each other. Um, and so we'll talk about that. Uh, we're doing English Tudor, French, Spanish, Mediterranean, Italian, Mission, Georgian, Federal, Colonial Revival, all those different styles which are fun. Um, it is a design inspiration from the past. There is a ton, and I brought out all these books. Uh, in this period of time, there was more books written about that architecture and that stuff. Most of my library is that stuff, um, is from the early 1900s to the 1940s, uh, as architects, designers, uh, writers wrote about these architectural styles. So there's the Spanish House for America, there's the Tudor House for America, there's the Colonial Revival House, how to build your Colonial Revival House, all kinds of stuff like that. We'll talk about Hollywood, but certainly the storybook style of architecture and some of these whimsical things that happen. Um, this is actually a reprint of this book, uh, David, uh, Mark Appleton, an architect in um, uh, California, <clears throat> he reprinted this book with a lot of pretty pictures, it's, which points to the fact that this is still relevant today. Uh, there was a guy named Samuel Chamberlain who did all these beautiful prints and drawings of uh, architecture in France. Uh, there's books like this put by, by the uh, Small House Bureau uh, of Architects. Basically, the AIA got together and said, people can't afford beautiful houses anymore. Let's put together some designs so that they can be readily available. Anyway, there's hundreds of these books. Um, they're still excellent resources. The reason why I'm showing those is because 
I want you to build up your library of these books as you study these styles. Um, these are the best references. And we'll talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about technology a little bit. We kind of pushed off technology. We're going to talk about it now, especially in the kitchen. And then next time with mid-century remodeling, we're going to talk about garages and how they develop. Um, and then kind of comparison to today. Where are we? 1920s. What's going on in the world in 1920? Population is now growing to 106 million. Uh, <clears throat> we are sandwiched right between two world wars. Uh, world War I ends in 1918. World War II, we start in 1941-ish. And so the, uh, we're, we're caught right between that period of time. The Great Depression happens right in this period of time, which you'll, we'll see. And then we're still really split between urban and, and, uh, and rural. And right on about that 50% mark between being an urban mostly urban country versus mostly rural country. Um, these are the main events. World War II ends in 1918, kicks off the Roaring Twenties. America turns 150 years old in 1926. This is the poster for the sequicentennial in Philadelphia. It was very popular, starts, in, you know, really uh, uh, encourages that colonial revival uh, era and feel. The Great Depression starts in 1929. Um, and then America into the World War II. So kind of an interesting period of time, but I think it's one of my favorite because when I look at these historic books and I look at these things, they, they capture the beauty and charm of building. Um, they sell it really well. These are millwork catalogs. The home, you know, right? Home reflects character, more molds character, right? Just this flowery, uh, love of the house and so um, the way they sell the house the way they share what a house should look like I think is very beautiful um, the woman uh, and her role in designing the house is very important there's a middle catalog in the 20s the Morgan catalog and the opening 20 pages are these women in different rooms of the house discussing you know how the house should work how it should come together uh, the breakfast nook was a very popular thing in the 1920s. Um, so in, anyway, I love this period of time, <clears throat> mainly because I look at these books and I fall in love with the illustrations. But what prompted this era, right? Why did, why did we go from, you know, I explained, talked about the arts and crafts period last time, but how do you go from this simple arts and crafts bungalow to, you know, medieval France, right? Um, what is what is the impetus? What 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 happens? Um, it's it, it's interesting. World War One, I, I said, ended in 1918, but a number of other technologies and stuff were really happening at this time that made this era possible. First of all, you have steamships, and travel to Europe became something that was uh, easier. Okay, you could go to Europe in seven to fifteen days, whereas a sailing ship, remember, steamships and steam things, really only start coming around in the early 1900s. And so, it, you know, we were sailing to Europe before then, um, which seems funny. Uh, and it would take, you know, month to three months to get across. It was very dangerous. You could, you know, die on those trips. Uh, the ships could go down. The steamship and steamship travel really changed that. The train in America, uh, train travel is the reason we can go to all these different parts of our country. And so travel becomes a really important thing. Um, and these are just some of the travel posters that were advertising and promoting going to Rome, going to these different areas. Um, and then World War II, uh, World War I. It can't be, uh, you know, stressed enough how <clears throat> enchanting, okay, uh, uh, Europe was to Americans. And there are uh, numerous examples of architects and designers who go to France in World War I, serving the thing and then stay there or then return there because they were so enchanted. If you look at, uh, I talked about um, this book from Samuel McIntyre. He was a artist and designer. He, he actually goes there and just starts drawing these beautiful <clears throat> medieval, you know, rural towns in France, in Normandy. And uh, they're just so enchanting. got a cookie in my throat um, and they're so beautiful and they they draw us in 
And so if you, you can still get this book, but it's filled with pages and pages and pages of drawings of these uh, enchanting towns and enchanting villages, and it draws us over there. And we long and to emulate and build in this style, this enchanting style. John Staub, we're working on this Staub house here in Fort Worth, 1928, uh, roughly. It's an English revival house. He goes over, serves in World War I. He goes back in the mid-20s and travels around Europe for a couple years getting inspiration. And he says that this, this element, this kind of gable end detail, was something he saw in England, couldn't forget, drew it up, and came back and built it in America. So this was happening over and over again. Charles Dilbeck was an architect who built in this kind of this French country style. I mean, he, he's a regional architect, Tulsa, Dallas, Fort Worth, but I'm not sure anyone I've seen captures, maybe the storybook style houses, captures the romance and, you know, Hansel and Gretel kind of, uh, 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 character that he captured in, 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 his, uh, in his houses with these, you know, simple poles, a lot of hand-hewn uh, architecture. These were his plans for his house. There was, it's interesting, uh, Willis Winter, is that his name? name? Winter Willis? Willis yes, Winter? Willis. Yes. Willis. Willis Winter. Thank you. He uh, is, give, is writing a book on, on, on Dilbeck, and he was explaining that Dilbeck only had one book in his library. And it was this. It was this book, okay, um, which is just a bunch of pictures of, of France, okay, just a bunch of pictures of, of areas. And one of the things that Dilbeck does in his house is he has his exterior stair, and you wonder, well, where did he get that? Well, if you go through the pictures in these books, the thatch roofs and the way he's he's holding up uh, uh, dormers and gable ends, he used this book as inspiration for how he was going to build. And so these romantic, this is a Dilbeck we're working on right now. Uh, his plans were so efficient, so compact on three pages, like three pages this big. He had all of this detail uh, laid out as far as how things should look. The scale of his windows, look at that small little dormer up there that really captured that, that look that you see in those Samuel McIntyre drawings or Samuel Chamberlain drawings and the pictures. Um, he captured, as well as anybody, that medieval, early kind of de design with uh, unique details and unique elements. And I think America just fell in love with these things. The other thing is that everybody, and I mean everybody, the government, the architects, the manufacturers, was wrapped up in this you know, peer revival styling. And so we're gonna see, as we look at these different people, how everybody got involved. Uh, Ludoichi, tile manufacturer, 1880s or 1870s is when they started. They started from 29 to 33, they did what was called the Tuileries, okay? They're now, you can, you can buy them on eBay, There's, they're put together in books. They're basically travel journals from architects. Samuel Chamberlain did one of these, I don't know if there's, uh, but famous architects would, would write these things and they would travel through different areas of Europe writing about what, what they're seeing. Now, Ludoichi was looking at it as a inspiration for roof tiles, an inspiration for how to build, right? But if you look at these, you know, 10% of these, you know, travel diaries are spent on the roofs. There are pictures of roofs there, but they're certainly not um, a study of a roof where you'd look at the size of the tile and the shape and when it was made or anything like that. So this is a love affair of, you know, by Ludoichi to, you know, show off uh, Europe and what was being built there. Uh, the White Pine Association started what's called uh, the White Pine Monograph Series. Uh, these are excellent resources for colonial revival architecture in America. Um, you can buy these on eBay. They come in, in these little little packets. I, I've got collections that are rebound, but there are drawings and details of individual houses and what they would do. There's pictures um, and they went around, I don't know if I've got it here, they started in the White Pine series, right? It was the White Pine Association for about nine years there. They studied uh, historic houses that had been built in White Pine. So they were Massachusetts, uh, you know, all those New England states. Um, 
Weyerhaeuser bought it and they started studying more of the southern states, not necessarily just white pine things. And then it became a part of Pencil Point magazines after that. But there is no better, well, this is a really good one. Uh, there's a bunch of good ones. But this white pine series is a fascinating study of colonial architecture, again, put out by a manufacturer uh, doing white pine. We got to consider that the government was involved in this, with the HABS uh, surveys and the HABS studies. HABS is Historic American Building Surveys. They started in 1933. It was part of the, you know, get America back to work after uh, the Great Depression. But architects would go around to great buildings and document them. And if you have, like, we did a study of Stan Hewitt, which is that house there in Ohio. Um, there's a picture, HABS, Ohio, 5008, or whenever they did that. But there is no greater treasury of the architectural history in America than the Habs journals. And if you go on to, if you just type in Habs, all this Habs information will come up and there's drawings and there's pictures and there's details. Um, it's crazy how much information is there. We've done a number of great research projects through Habs because the information is so good. Private people were involved, Colonial Williamsburg, um, this was a effort, Rockefeller was the major donor here, but to, to recapture our first, you know, capital, which was at uh, Colonial Williamsburg. And so uh, they rebuilt this town and there's a, there's a book that was written about the rebuilding of Williamsburg and how they rebuilt this, this city and this town. Uh, but the architectural documentation that was there, I was there about two or three years ago. People been to Colonial Williamsburg? Mm -hmm. If you haven't gone, okay, that's your next trip. Um, it's fantastic. It's it is really a uh, inspiring, encouraging place. I mean, little things like like how they laid out the siding so that it lined up with the windowsill and just the the level of detail that they went to is fascinating and awesome. Um, but there's great architecture there. Great study of that. Again, done by a private donor. Um, winter tour. We talked about Winter Tour before. Who's been to Winter Tour? I know you have. The uh, Alice. No one's been to Winter Tour, but Lisa and Alice. Okay, get out. <laughs> My word. Okay, Winter Tour is your next stop. Okay. Uh, basically, Henry Dupont fell in love with American antiques. Okay. He started uh, collecting them. Um, and he would find out about a house in Philadelphia that was being torn down. He'd buy the parlor and install it in his house. And his house was started as a, you know, 4,000, 6,000 square foot house. It ended up being over 100,000 square feet, 175 rooms from 1640 to 1860. He's captured everything that's pre-industrial in America. There is uh, every colony is represented, every style is represented. You will see a very early house like this, wherever that's from. Uh, this one's from Maryland, a very high style house in 1760. This is probably 1720 or earlier. There's everything there. And if you are interested in uh, architectural interiors, obviously there's, there's uh, furniture there. There's, I mean, this is the finest collection of American antiques and antiquity in the world, okay? And you haven't been there! <laughs> so you need to go. But that's, uh, this was happening in the 20s too, right? So he started his collection in 21. He was collecting into the 50s. Um, this is the place you need to go. Hollywood, right? We talked about the storybook style. Now, Hollywood Regency style is the 40s, 50s, you know, 60s things as Hollywood influence becomes even greater. But in the 20s and 30s, there was this, you know, <laughs> whimsical, magical, you know, uh, as I said, Hansel and Gretel kind of building that took place, but certainly this was a style. This was happening. People were doing this stuff again, and there's this enchantment with medieval architecture in Europe. And I, and I, you know, how did we get here? That started with the question, what happened? I think we just kind of fell in love with this style and became enamored with it. And as you can see, everybody was right. Everybody was looking at this thing. So, uh, Illusion. Um, talking to my sound man. The uh, builders were involved, right? The things that they were selling were, you know, period revival things. 
uh, and their design. We'll talk about where their design came from. But, you know, wonderful period. This is 1929. Uh, that's 27, right? These are wonderful. Uh, I mean, I'd like to build that house today, right? Awesome. So we become enchanted with Europe. Uh, we become enchanted with, with these designs and this architecture and the scale and the amount of craftsmanship and just the beauty there. And so we're going to kind of dig into the European aspect. We've got, you know, England, London, UK, you got France, and then you've got this Mediterranean. And the Mediterranean is going to, you know, encompass a number of different Italian, Spanish, you know, the southern France, all these different things. But we're going to talk about, you know, how these styles change as you go from colder climates to warmer climates. Roof pitches change, roof materials change, right? You think about these houses that were built, you know, in France in 1600, all local materials, all local traditions, you know, there was a way of building in Normandy that wasn't happening in, you know, uh, southern France, right? And so there's very regional styles and regional details that are going on that make this even more lovely. You don't see the same thing over and over again. Okay, so we'll start with the English and the Tudor revival. All right, the Tudor period is, you know, 1485-1603. It's kind of late medieval, right? It's right before the Renaissance starts happening. So, you know, the Renaissance is happening in, in Italy, 14, 1400s, 1500s, right? And so that classicism creeps towards England very slowly. So they've got their own stylings and their own details that are part of this Tudor period. Um, you know, certainly the timber frame buildings that they were building, um, you know, the leaded glass and this kind of leaded glass detail. We're working on a house right now with some barge boards and the decorative barge boards, but all of this kind of style and building, um, there's areas of England like the Cotswolds that are just so charming and so unique. Um, the scale of the houses and everything else. We've had numerous clients ask us to build a Cotswold house just because they go there and they fall in love with it. Rightly so. Um, thatch roofs, right? This is this actually is Hansel and Gretel's house. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but start picking up on the details that we're going to see as we look at these uh, pictures. Um, you know, this effort to match the thatch roof. You'll see those houses that have the rolled uh, gable ends and the things where they're trying with shingles, like asphalt shingles, trying to capture this that that thatch roof feel. But it's so magical, right, with the with the cresting at the top and everything else. But the scale of the windows, leaded glass, right, that's very important. Plank doors, um, the gardens, the gates, right. So you're going to start chimney pots. You're going to start seeing those things want to be copied in America um, by architects and designers. So stone walls, see this detail here where we've got, you know, stone and brick infill that tell a story. We're going to see that on American style houses where you have brick and then you've got rubble of stone coming through there. All of these things are efforts for us to look at that and go, hmm, how do I do that back home? Um, which is awful fun. The French style, French revival things, um, you know, you've got kind of three regions. You've got Normandy, which is northern France, you've got the Loire Valley, and then you've got Provence. So. Um, each one will have a different style and a different detail. Um, Lower Valley was a very, it was kind of right, go back one. It's the middle part of, of uh, France. It goes up into Paris uh, or just below Paris. It was a very wealthy area. And so, um, you know, the Biltmore is done in this, which is a little earlier, but it's done in this Chateau-esque style. But this is where that design comes from. This is where that look is. Uh, all the rich people lived here because that's where the vineyards were, right on the valley. Uh, and so they were all competing for and trying to design their, uh, their different looks. I mean, where do you think Disney World came from, right? I mean, that, you know, is Disneyland, right, with all the turrets and all the... It's why? It's magical, right? It's, it's uh, mysterious. It's like, who builds like this anymore? So it's enchanting. So... Um, that, that, so you've got that rich part of, part of town. Normandy is, is a poorer area, more medieval, smaller villages, where you see the timber framing. And then some of the things we're going to see as we look at period of idle houses of this period is a lot of timber framing. And what happens, the way it's 
you know, <laughs> interpreted in America is, is that it ends up being um, European and not necessarily, we're going to look at some houses and I'm going to say, you know, what style is that? And you're going to go, it's, uh, right? Well, it's kind of European and it's not strongly English or strongly French. Looked at this thing a little bit earlier. Um, the overhangs, um, the stone and timber work, uh, the tile. Certainly the tile is something that uh, Ludovici was trying to copy. Charming little, and this is, this is pictures from this book, which is what the book that uh, um, Dilbeck was using or used for inspiration. Uh, and then when you go into southern France, uh, you begin to see what's happening here, right? In, in northern France, you have snow loads, okay? So roofs have to be pitched very steeply. In southern France, you don't have snow loads, and so you have roofs that change. And so the architecture is changing, right, because of regional differences, because of climate, because of availability of stone. I mean, people love that caramely uh, colored stone from the Cotswolds, and they want to match that and, because it's just so enchanting. So we try to find these regional things. Um, but these are all, I mean, this, this, as we get down into the Mediterranean area, right, you're seeing these barrel tile roofs, you're seeing low pitches, um, and, you know, this is southern France, but it could easily be part of the Mediterranean. Uh, that Mediterranean is kind of a big area, right? You have Amalfi uh, Coast and, and the kind of building that was going on there, the bright colors, uh, the architecture, even flat roofs in some of these areas, uh, decorative tile, colorful tiles. Um, right on the water and, and stucco, right, stucco finishes. Um, think about this Mediterranean area. You also have um, Palladian architecture, which is Italian in this Italian style, which is very formal, uh, very balanced, right? Uh, right, here's, a, here's another Palladian village uh, or Palladian house, right? But just, you know, if you've been to Europe and you've you know been to France and you've sat on these you know, gravel uh, uh, patios where the, the, the weather's so wonderful, um, they are magical places and they are enchanting. Um, things up here like this is the dovecot up here, sundial, barrel tile roost, open loggias, right? Um, very inviting place to want to go in and stay. This is what enchanted us. On the colonial side, okay, in America, not everybody was doing European things, but there was also strong exposure for what was going on in America, and that's, that's why that travel, the train travel, becomes so important. Um, but you have things that the missions of, San, of, of California, the, the, the ranch tile of architecture that happens, uh, the early ranching things, and then, of course, the stuff on the East Coast, which, you know, uh, the White Pine series and, and Habs and everything else we're looking at, but you've got a lot of different styles of architecture happening in America that's, that's very uh, contagious, right? Mount, Mount Vernon. There are a number of colonial revival houses, especially in the 40s, that copy this Mount Vernon architecture. And you've seen those high front porches with the tall skinny columns. You know, that, the proportions of that column, right, right, as far as the cannons go, um, or Italian cannons go, Palladian cannons isn't really right, but it works, it's part of our heritage, it's part of what we uh, are trying to build and emulate, and of course, that's what's happening there. Um, Monticello, obviously Thomas Jefferson's home. Uh, this is Colonial Williamsburg. It was certainly very enchanting and lighting, and, and then just the architecture, this would be mid-Atlantic, right? So you're in Virginia, okay, so there's a, we're discovering that there is a style of architecture that's built in mid, the mid-Atlantic area of, of the United States that's different from the things that were built in Boston or New York. Again, there's regional differences for us, just like there is in Europe. And architects are dialing into these differences, looking at them going, hmm, which, which things should I copy? Uh, we were, and we'll talk about design a little bit later, but we were better copyists um, then than we are today. It's one reason why I think our houses are not as charming as they were historically. So if we look at design, okay, there's the, I mentioned this book. Um, it's a reprint. It's, uh, Dover did a reprint. You can, you can still get this on Amazon. It's done by the, uh, 
the Architects Small House Service Bureau, okay? So this was AIA Architects providing plans for small houses. They were saying, look, most people can't afford an architect. We're gonna provide a design service so people get good design. Look what they're doing here, okay? Architecture, what is it, right? They are educating their client on what you know architecture is, what styles are, what, what's going on. Um, and if you can't afford a, house, small, a large house, what do you do? How do you still get good design in a small house? They were trying to solve that. The other thing that's interesting to me is the Americanization of this, you know, of these styles. Reminiscent of an English cottage with a plan, however, distinctly American throughout. Uh, Elizabethan, which is, that's terrible, Elizabethan house. Uh, as interpreted today, and then in the manner of the Italian villa, right? And so what, we, what we're gonna see is, is that, you know, we look at all those charming medieval villages and things like that. We really don't copy that very well in this, in this period. There are still, like that's a charming house. There are great details in that house, but um, if you're expecting us to see, you know, those, you know, leaning, you know, 400 year old barns, people aren't rebuilding those. <laughs> Um, the details in here, I think, are lovely. Um, I think that it may be just the way that they're hand sketched, but uh, the elements that they're getting right, right? The, the, the leaded glass, the, the strap of hardware, the plank doors, um, the lanterns, um, the stucco, the proportions. There's just a number of wonderful details, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about kind of what's wrong with houses today. So people the details that came out of this book are really wonderful, and they're still very inspiring. Um, <coughs> we wanted to build this house at one point. The problem with these houses, um, and you can see that they're just infused with uh, good design details, is they're small. Um, 1,400 square feet, right? 1,800 square feet. Uh, so it's difficult. There is no informal living room. <laughs> the kitchen is very small, which we'll talk about. and so. One of the challenges in this effort is, you know, taking this and making it bigger um, and making it work today. Um, so it, it's, it, we're gonna we're gonna go walk through some historic neighborhoods here, but um, you know, this is an example of <laughs> a miss, I think, in my mind, <laughs> right? Um, you know, what is it really? And. Uh, I mean, there's some twisted columns here, right? And, and they're not bad. There's arches in there. Maybe Italian, right? There's arches there. It's, it's kind of, but you know, I don't know what that is. Is that a, that's your house? We can fix it. Um, <laughs> um, all right. So what I did was I just drove through some period revival neighborhoods over here. I went through uh, Park Hill and I went through Berkeley. Um, and so just looking at some houses, I think this is lovely. Um, you know, th they get a lot of the details and a lot of the materials, right? In my opinion, the cut stone around here, uh, the timbers and the, and the shaping of those timbers that you see, remember that Tudor house we looked at, uh, but it had almost round timbers going through, the, going through, uh, as a decorative element, the way they, uh, uh, deal with the brickwork here it's it's it changes in three different gable ends which you see sometimes uh, a little bit of leaded glass uh, the proportions are really nice tile roof or a slate roof can't tell um, but that's a that's a lovely house i think um, but you know is it english is it tudor is it french yeah, probably more english than anything else um, what about this one what style is that Do you see this? Yeah, it's something, right? Uh, it's not a great answer. Um, but, the, but the pitch of that roof is a little more French, right? You've got this, this, this uh, clip, the, the hipped roof there, right? Which is, it tends to be a little bit more of a French detail. But, it's, but it, you know, it, and certainly you saw the timbering is happening in the, all over Europe at this time. You go anywhere in Europe, that's how they built, right? And so it isn't necessarily just English. Would you still have the way they've uh, put the brink, brick in between the timbers? I love how they peg. That's something that we see typical of this period. Little brackets like this. Um, I think this is a fun house. 
This one? <laughs> right, it's probably Mediterranean, it's probably Italian, right? Maybe something like that. If this thing wasn't on there, it would be uh, a really composed, you know, house. I, this, this is a miss to me um, because everything else is pretty balanced and symmetrical. Um, that's kind of an add-on that wasn't necessary. The door's not original. Um, but, but, it's, but it's, you know, this is where it's kind of a mix and blend of different styles. Sometimes they're done really well and sometimes they aren't. What style do you think this one is? There's, there's no wrong answers, okay? <laughs> you can say Colonial Revival and I'll give you something. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it, it, it's probably more, you know, that Mediterranean Italian thing. And, and here's where, you know, if this was done in a different material, if this was done in, in stucco as opposed to brick, it might work a little bit better. Um, but, I mean, the, the twisted uh, columns here, um, you, know, I don't, I, you know, I don't recognize that decorative paneling detail, but um, it's nice. The iron work is certainly, is certainly good. A um, lot of different details going on there. This one's nice, right? <laughs> you knew that one, uh, right? Because they, they've got the, the stucco, the roof, uh, this kind of porch balcony. Uh, a lot of fun things happening here that, that make this work. Um, and I think this is a really charming house. I actually had friends who lived in this house. Um, but I'm not sure exactly what style that is. Right? Yeah, I mean, there, it's a little bit of French and English, um, but that's a charming house. <laughs> Again, kind of med Mediterranean Italian, right? Kind of uh, the balance and composition is good. I mean, it looks good from the street. Um, here's where you get into that that uh, stone choice, which is a little bit interesting. Um, I'm not sure it works exactly, but I've seen that. That, be, that was a very popular look. Um, I've seen those with petrified stone, kind of that same look that's really interesting and really beautiful. But fun details there. As you step from Park Hill, right, which is a more expensive neighborhood if you're not from that area, into Berkeley, you see houses shrink in size. So those houses that are just showing are, you know, 4,000 feet and up. You know, this house is probably 2,500, 3,000 feet, right? So it shrinks down. I think the detail uh, doesn't shrink with it, right? Because there's still a lot of detail going on here and a lot of fun elements um, that make this really charming. And that is a cottage, right? That's a little English or French cottage that uh, is really charming, really handsome. Um, this is back in Berkeley. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. This is these are these are bigger houses, right? You're seeing some of those details. That one's a little bit of a miss. A lot of interesting things happening here with the small windows and roofs and everything else. This is one of the bigger houses in, in Park Hill. Uh, very composed, right? This is that that symmetry and the balance between the sides. Um, a little more high style probably Italian, um, certainly, you know, Mediterranean, pretty roof. Let me go back over to Berkeley. Uh, the houses get a little bit smaller. This is a bigger one. That's probably 3,500 square feet. Nice open porch, nice loggia there. Um, this is, again, is a smaller one. But the brickwork in detail uh, is really nice. Uh, I mean, Richard, I think your house is in this vein, right? It's that pure revival, uh, fun details. As far as sometimes you'll see a swoop that goes down really low, but good brickwork, good details um, laid out there. Italian, right? Probably Mediterranean, right? So fun stuff, right? So you're seeing what's happening in this period, how uh, the style isn't necessarily pure, but it's Americanized, and that's what everybody was trying to do. So I think that's neat. Now, technology. I've been pushing off technology because, you know, technology begins to happen in houses as early as the 1880s, 1890s, when we have early electricity, early gas, 
early water being run to houses. Um, you know, running water was available in the 1880s. The light bulb was 1879. Uh, you know, telephone in 1876. But there's a website, Our World Data, that has adoption of technology. And if you look at it, this little band here, there's a lot of, you know, technology acceptance that's happening here. And that's why when we were talking about late Victorian things, even though they had been invented, right? I think the number in, uh, I don't know if I wrote it down there, but that running water to the house wasn't, you know, over 60% until like 1940, which is crazy to me. Um, is that right? I could probably look it up. Yeah, I mean, if there's 1940, right? So 60%, so summertime's in 1930. We start having, you know, 50% people having running water in their houses. Um, but so technology happens and it affects how those houses are built and what's going on here. Perfect example is the telephone. You know, it was invented in 1876. This is a 1927 catalog that was actually selling phone niches, right? Um, look at the stair hall with the phone niche. That was extra. Um, but, I mean, if you guys grew up watching movies like, and shows like I did, Fathers Knows Best, remember that show? Oh my God, that, I that, show. <laughs> that, that phone was right at the bottom of the stair, and everybody sat at the bottom of the stair and they listened to the phone. Um, the other one was uh, It's a Wonderful Life, right? When he kind of gets together, everybody loves that movie. When he gets together with his wife, and they're kind of arguing and fighting, and they, they get married, the, the, the phone is right at the bottom of the stairs, and so, that was iconic, right, from the 20s right into the 40s and 50s. And so one place, you know, of course, we have our phones now that we carry in our back pocket, but that wasn't the way things were then. Kitchens are another thing, right? So uh, I basically got the kitchen household pieces and, and where they were, and you see this adoption happening in this 20s to 40s, running water, refrigerators, electric power, stoves. In 1920, okay, this is what a kitchen looked like, okay? Uh, there's cabinets, kind of lower cabinets, open sink. I was told one time, somebody told me this, um, that the reason they showed the pipes underneath this, uh, the kitchen, they wanted that, that showed, was to show that they had running water in their house, right? It was kind of a, a way to show off their wealth. Um, so, who's your cabinet? And, you know, uh, uh, range, okay? Um, by the way, that range that's in the, in the kitchen right there, that's a 1921. It stood up on cabrio legs like this. If you want to see what a, a stove looked like from that period, it's right in there. So Hoosier Cabinet in 1920 had a design competition for the best kitchens. And this was the winner. <laughs> um, looks like a closet today, right? <laughs> it's, it's like a pantry. Um, the reason why it wins, okay, is because in this period of time, the, uh, uh, it was a work area, it was a workout, where it was a work room, right? And these, these little things here were time studies that they did to see how, how many steps you took to go from one place to the, to the next. So they were trying to figure out the most efficient space possible to cook in, right? And so, let's see, put my thing, so there's the refrigerator, where's the sink? Okay, there's the sink here. I kind of turn it around this way. Um, the sink was on the back side of the dining room. Um, and then these were your only cabinets. And this is why in 1920, you really don't see cabinets advertised in the millware catalogs because they really weren't using them the way, you know, we would use them today. These were other, you know, winning, uh, uh, contributions to to the Hoosier Cabinet Company. So basically, Hoosier Cabinet Company, which was a great you know idea, it was a baking center, is everything all in one. You opened it up, you got your flour, you did your cooking. They had a, uh, a a special top there, so you could knead your bread and do all these things. It was a very efficient piece, right? And so they hired architects, or they opened up this competition to see who would you know create the best kitchen with a Hoosier cabinet, which is what they're trying to do. This one doesn't even have kitchen cabinets, right? It just has a Hoosier cabinet, there's your stove, there's your sink. Um, yeah, this one has cabinets on either side, but again, they're very sparse, they're very small spaces. Um, this is a, a millwork catalog from 1921. Here's your exposed piping. Um, it was rare, rare in my experience to see cabinets on two walls pre-1930. Um, most kitchens look like this. Most countertops in this period 
have you know depth about 20 inches. If you try to put an old a new dishwasher in these things, they don't fit, um, and so that's pretty typical. This is 27, so six years later, right? They're, they're, you're beginning to see a lot more cabinets come in here, cabinets going all the way to the ceiling, um, different details in there. Um, this is the first time, 27, you, for, you find component cabinets that you can buy like this, right? Because before then, what you were doing is you were ordering, you were building the boxes on site and you're ordering the cabinet doors. So you would build it, you'd measure it out, you'd say, I need you know, six cabinet doors this size by this size, and they would send you the cabinet doors. Now by 27, they're starting to uh, provide pre-built cabinets, and then these are the accessories you can add. Right, there's the cook, the, the chop top that goes for the countertop. There's the flower bin thing that you might have seen that tips out, right? And so um, the kitchen is advancing. 1936, okay, and look what happens to millwork catalogs, okay? You, you wonder what the Great Depression did to us um, in this period of time. This is 1920, this is 1936, right? This is hardcover, beautiful. Um, uh, rendered pictures in here, some of the pictures you, uh, you've seen, but if you just look at these, um, you know, the colored drawings, uh, these drawings here, right? This is a book that uh, is beautiful. <laughs> this is not. <laughs> this has black and white pictures. Uh, it's very utilitarian. Um, still good information in there, but this is you know, the houses are really changing and the Great Depression certainly had a lot to do with it. Um, these kitchens, I think I did, are pretty typical that eight, by, eight foot six by 12 foot. They talked about a typical 10 foot top, which is what that one was. And so there's 10 foot sections. So kitchens were still small. They weren't quite as small. They were in the 20s, but um, they were still small. Notice too, no, uh, if you walk into an old kitchen, you wonder what period it is. Probably in the late 30s and early 40s, you start seeing plywood doors. Uh, you don't really see solid plywood doors like this uh, in the 20s. They're usually panel doors, uh, but you start to see those in, the, in that period. Um, some of the accessories, nice refrigerator. Um, you know, the cabinets don't go all the way to the ceiling anymore. That's something from the 20s, but in the 40s, you start seeing the fur down. Um, those things are happening. So, any questions on kitchens? Okay, so, now, why are period revival homes of the 20s better than period revival homes today? Any guesses? <coughs> architect, someone said architect, lumber quality. You don't know about lumber quality. <laughs> any other guesses? I have it there. What's that? Proximity to the original. Proximity to the original. In time and distance. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. You know, I noticed that uh, new houses that are trying to do traditional are much better in New England than they are here. And I think that has to do with that proximity to the original that you're describing. Uh, certainly what we see, uh, we, we get better at because we're good copiers. So this house, European influenced, French inspired, this doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? It's a little over the top, um, right? But this is an example of a period revival French ch chateau looking thing that in my opinion is ugly. And so, you know, these big blank windows with no divided lights, these, that, that there's, there's no sense of scale here. Um, it's meant to show off, right? It's not, it doesn't have that, doesn't capture that scale and that beauty of, of the traditional houses. If you think about the design influences that were available in the 20s from, you know, magazines, we didn't even talk about magazines and their influence, but certainly the drawings, Habs, uh, Colonial Williamsburg, places people were looking, there was a strong emphasis and study on, on getting things right. And today, um, we, there is a non-unified voice, whatever the word is, it, there's a non-unified voice and there's so much information that comes from here, right, and here that is bad, okay, because people go, you know, people that aren't 
uh, they're excited about architecture, but they don't know. And so they post things. They go, look at this French thing. It's not French, right? And they look at this English thing. And I can't tell you the number of manufacturers that will have molding catalogs saying this is a Georgian molding and it's nothing close to a Georgian molding. So there is a, uh, a level of uh, understanding and expertise that we've lost. And, and there's, I'm, I'm hinting at a little bit because I'm setting us up for the next talk, which is on the mid-century modern and post-World War II building. Um, because a lot of these things are happening there. The architect, that someone said the architect, um, drifts away from residential design, okay? And so we, we end up with things like this, right? Where, you know, more carved moldings, the better, right? Just, just throw a bunch of carvings and people will think I spent a lot of money, right? And, <laughs> and it's, it's a mess, you know, and then modernism comes in and we, we look at the, the house that looks like the, you know, the Apple store and, or, you know, strip mall and you go, hmm, you know, what's right? You know, what, what is good modernism? What's, what's bad modernism? What, how do I know? We don't know. And so there is a, um, there are, there are very few, I would say, <laughs> Let me go on the shelf here. We're going to the limb here. I would say in Texas, there's probably 10 architects who are good. <laughs> How many architects are in here? 10 architects. They're right here. Um, when I say good, I mean good at residential period design. Okay? There are great architects all over. Okay? But to, to get this style right, um, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. One of my favorite architects in Pennsylvania is a guy named John Milner. He started out as a preservationist. He was actually going into old buildings, measuring the buildings, figuring out how the rafter tail worked, figuring out how the sash worked. And he is an excellent uh, designer of period houses today because he studied the old stuff really, really hard for a long time. So it takes that expertise and you can't go on Pinterest and educate yourself. You guys are not coming next week, right? <laughs> or next time. Most of the revival houses architecturally designed, or were they mostly just copied? That's a good question. Uh, what percentage of uh, houses today are designed by an architect? What do you guys think? Five. Two to three percent. Two to three percent. Now you got to qualify that, okay, because a production builder might have an architect on staff, and they say, well, all those houses are designed by architect. I wouldn't say that those are houses are designed by an architect, okay? So very few, even traditionally, were designed by an architect, okay? The problem is, part of the problem today, and I'm kind of tipping my hand to the next time we talk about this, is modernism comes in, and the schools are stop teaching traditional design. In classical design, they teach modern design, and so architects get out of school and they don't know how to do that because they didn't study that, right? The good traditional architects that I know describe getting out of architecture school and going back and studying those buildings themselves to become proficient like they are today. So good point. They're, they're, most houses aren't designed by an architect and it's the reason why I can say there's probably only 10 in Texas who are any good because most aren't trained and done. So we have a strong need for talented designers today. It doesn't have to be an architect. It just we, we need talented people who, who care about these things. Um, we need to be better students of the past. As I look at these books and all the work that went into studying and documenting the past of those things, I see, in my mind, it's clear they're better in the past than they are today because we spent more time studying them. We spent more time looking at them. We spent more time measuring them. And so we need to be better students. Um, then the strong need for the, the art of building, the lost art of building. To execute this, okay, takes skill, okay? You can't just hand that to a guy and expect him to execute that well. Not only, uh, you know, if it's a timber, but, but pegging it and, and putting this together, turning these things so that scale and proportion are right, building that door, it takes hard work. It's, it's, it's not easy. And so, I, I said this quote again, okay, builders think that because their houses are selling, they're well-designed. 
Homeowners think that because it was built, someone must have designed it, okay? And that's not true in either side, right? And so it, there's a lot of houses being built today that are assembled, okay, that are not designed. Okay, and then this is the, the tip to the, the next, next talk. What happened to architects? And, I, and I, I explained that a little bit. But in the 1920s, okay, the architects designed in the same styles, right? The, the Montgomery Ward building. There was five Montgomery Ward buildings around, this, around the country done in that Mission Revival style, right? And so they were designing houses in that style. They were designing commercial buildings in that style. And if you d drive around these historic neighborhoods, I mean, Highland Park Village, right? There's a period revival, uh, mission revival style. Um, there's numerous examples all over Fort Worth of you know, pre-1940 things that were done in the same style. So there was a language in a, and, and happening that is lost today. Um, and then as we look, go forward, right? This is what William Levitt was building in 1950. This was being celebrated in 1950, right? So the split that takes place between, you know, residential and commercial, res, uh, architects and, and, you know, house design things and what William Levitt does, it's astounding um, and awesome what we're going to see as far as how that happens. So get, that'll be fun for next time. Lesson to take home, go to Europe. <laughs> that'll be fun, right? Put the, uh, put the tab on Alice. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, so what was the difference between, what is the difference between an eclectic tutor and a genuine tutor house? What is the difference between an eclectic tutor and a genuine tutor house? Mm -hmm. Well, like your house? Yes. Like it, your, house was, <laughs> your house was designed, by, it built, bought it by a plan book, executed by a builder, okay, okay an architect wasn't involved. A good tutor, like, no. A good tutor like Stan, Stan Hewitt, okay, that house in, in Ohio, the, uh, it was a famous architect. The client went to Europe. They studied three houses in Europe. They took notes, copious notes, and they came back and they built this magnificent tutor house, the finest tutor house in America, in my opinion. That's the difference, right? I mean, yours was then a plan book built by a builder. That was done by an architect. Now, if you just want to keep it in Fort Worth, it's a little bit of the same thing. John Staub did the, the his number of nice Tudor houses, right? He was a guy who went and studied in Europe and, you know, saw those details and, and put those together. He went to MIT, I mean, is very well thought of. And so money, right, the, the amount of money that you spend. And then, uh, but, I mean, that doesn't mean your house isn't charming. No, I, I, I would take your house over any new house today, right? And so, but you asked a question. And, <laughs> Well, like bathrooms and closets and kitchens were the tiniest possible. Well, the, we know that why the kitchens were small is because they were workspaces. Yes. The bathrooms were a fairly new thing. There's three bedroom, four bedrooms house with one bath, and right. so it, it's it was it wasn't considered that you would put numerous baths in there. They were bigger than outhouses. Yeah. They were bigger than outhouses. That's that's a good point. That's a good Just point. Barely, That's a good point. We had to get, spe we had to get special toilets when we renovated because it was so small. Yeah. See? Don't you love old houses? I do. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. It wasn't an upgrade, it was a function of trying to heat the house. And so you'd have numerous chimneys where probably if you go back there, you can see where there's a, the oftentimes stoves in numerous rooms. If you look at those kitchens, uh, if I go back to these, uh, there's oftentimes uh, ta -da, um, these kind of flues, right? In old houses, you have a main chimney flue and then you'd have a service flue. And so that where numerous heating elements might go in to try to, it wasn't an upgrade, it was how they heated the house. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You didn't talk about Greek revivals. Is there any reason for 
Um, you missed the Greek revival. So we did. Oh, so here's the deal. This is period revival. We did. We started with Georgian last June, and then we did federal, and then we did Greek revival, and then we did Victorian twice, and then we did arts and crafts, and now we're at period revival. And next week, next week, next week, we're going to the uh, mid-century modern. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Any other questions? Um, I taught, I get the YouTube, uh, there's a number of Europeans that comment and they think their houses are junk. And so now I've gone and seen their, their masonry, the things I've seen, they're, they're making them with masonry. They don't build with two by fours like we build. Um, so in some respects, they're, uh, I don't know whether you consider that better. They're built differently, but, um, I, I think it's, it's all, it's a perspective. Um, I would say that they have better craftsmen there than we do um, because they still have a guild system. They still have an apprentice system. They still have with their craftsmen and masonry and stuff. Uh, is it, if you say, is our production house that D.R. Horton's building better than their production house? I would say their production house would probably be better because of their building traditions. But whether, you know, a $10 million house built in America versus there, I don't know. I, don't, I, I have never considered that. Yeah. We've got a Polish architect. He actually might be able to speak to this. Depends where. Depends where. Different traditions and the house we use. Yeah. Yes, sir. You're asking how building changed, right? Well, building practices, I mean. Yeah, so we're, I, that's a great setup for next time because <laughs> that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about is, is how those building practices changed because they changed dramatically after the Great Depression and World War II. And there's pent up demand and it changes housing and it's dramatic. So, good question. <laughs> and on that note, oh, one more, yeah. Like modern architecture, like modern, modern yeah. Um, I was in a house this week. Um, my, uh, I got a friend who's a realtor in Dallas. She took me to a, a $16 million house right there on Potomac in Dallas that was fantastic. It was done by an architect named Speck. Did you, know, you guys know that name? And uh, he is, it was a beautiful house. It was all iron and steel. It was, it was not something we build, uh, but the craftsmanship was incredible and it was a beautiful house. So there are examples like that, that you're, that are wow as much as any, anything I've seen, but there's a lot of junk out there in my opinion, because it's like me, when Mies van der Rohe built the Seagram's building uh, in New York, it was groundbreaking. The problem was, it was easy to copy, and now all downtowns look the same. And so the, the glass structure, the, the steel walls, and all those different things. And so really good modern architecture is really good, but there's a lot of copycats out there that aren't <laughs> as good. And so, and I, and I think that's true for a lot of buildings. It's easier to, to copy the modern. Yeah. Than yeah, that's true. Any other questions? There, there's more up there.
Which is okay. We can, we can commiserate about that later. Uh, all right, guys. Thank you guys so much for coming. See you May 19th.